Good afternoon to everybody. Obviously, we've all been through this one uh, before as well. But I do want to uh, once again thank everybody for taking the time today. I know there's a tremendous number of things uh, ongoing, particularly today with a holiday with Ashura. And, uh, and I do, of course, want to begin by expressing our deepest sympathies and our condolences for the victims of this absolutely senseless uh, act last night again. And uh, so our thoughts are with those victims and, and with their families. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, obviously, we'll run this the same way. I'd like to make a couple of open comments uh, and then we'll shift in and again happy to uh, welcome and entertain uh, any questions you have today. So as part of the opening comments, what I really want to do is touch on Kunduz first, move over to Hellman and then talk a little bit about the larger situation. But I think the thing that is really kind of common to all that we see right now is I want to refer back to April of 2016 when the Taliban really announced uh, Operation Omari and essentially their spring campaign. And since that point, what we know is that the Taliban have been focused on trying to seize a provincial capital. And of course, we saw significant effort uh, towards that in August in Lashkar Gah and then subsequently in Kunduz and then subsequently in Tarankot. We also saw efforts to try and take some major population centers in Hisarak and also in Janikel. And the bottom line is the Taliban was not successful uh, in those efforts. So what we believe we are seeing right now is we believe that we are seeing another significant push by the Taliban to try and take a provincial capital. And we also recognize, or we believe, that they understand that the year is soon coming to a close and we think they are really working uh, to try and achieve that objective. <clears throat> so let me begin first with Kunduz. And um, obviously the last week plus has been a challenge uh, for the government. But much more important than that, it has, uh, the Taliban attacks have just brought significant hardship and significant suffering uh, on the people of Kunduz and on the population uh, in that general region. And, you know, essentially what we've seen with these Taliban attacks, last month we saw the Taliban destroy the Alchin Bridge. The government rebuilt that very quickly, and commerce is back going over that. But since this attack uh, last week, we've seen the Taliban essentially destroy the power grid, uh, essentially cutting off electricity kund to Kunduz, water services. They've destroyed multiple cell towers. Uh, they have burned down homes, and they've essentially uh, evicted families uh, from their houses. And uh, the government, of course, is responding. And you heard President Ghani describe that uh, the other night. And, of course, the government is pushing resources that direction, but simply stated the end result of what has occurred up in Kunduz is that the Taliban has successfully uh, caused hardship and suffering for the people uh, of Kunduz. And they have not taken uh, that provincial capital. So from a tactical standpoint, um, for us, it was really never a question of whether or not Kundu City was going to fall to the Taliban, as essentially we saw uh, last year. After about the first several hours, what became clear, and the real question in our mind was, how long is it going to take to clear out these Taliban elements that are bringing all of this destruction um, on to Kundu City? And what we believe is, on the first night, the Taliban recognized that they were not going to successfully take the city. And so at that point, they changed their strategy. And essentially, they had been trying to prolong this fight for as long as possible by keeping small elements in the city, because obviously, it does bring an awful lot of press attention. It also puts significant pressure on the population, and therefore pressure on the population is going to put pressure on the government. And we, so we believe that their goal really, uh, essentially from the outset of this, was to attempt to prolong this fight for as long as possible. So specifically what we saw up there was we saw small, relatively small Taliban groups, five to ten armed with light weapons in some cases, heavy weapons in, in other cases, but they were able to move into a couple of locations within the city, and then they were able to bring this fire upon government centers and, and everything else. On top of that, as we know, they had absolutely no regard for civilian casualties, and they had no regard for destroying property up there. So really, they were able to move rapidly from one small position to the next, and then just destroying uh, as they went. And so I don't want to understate the Taliban and their capabilities, but I think it's important that we also don't overstate their capabilities. Um, because as the ANDSF moved in to secure and clear uh, the areas where the Taliban was, uh, led by the Afghan Special Forces, it becomes a very, very difficult tactical problem 
for Afghan forces to clear within a city, particularly when they are trying to avoid uh, civilian casualties and they are trying to prevent further destruction of the civilian infrastructure there. So it becomes a very challenging problem as these small groups of Taliban in a relatively isolated area move from one place to the area and, and bring that fire. Um, so where are we today? Uh, obviously, nobody is satisfied with what has happened uh, up in Kunduz. Again, you've heard uh, the Afghan leadership discuss it. We're not satisfied, and most important, the people of Kunduz uh, have suffered. But overall, we do believe for the last 48 hours that the situation up there is stabilizing, and the ANDSF continues to bring in re additional reinforcements. We think that uh, the Taliban that were remaining in the city uh, have been pushed out, and that the government is now working to really bring uh, additional services services and resources and everything to try and, and take care of the population up there. The next thing I want to touch on is Helmand. And so Helmand is somewhat different uh, than the situation we've seen up in Kunduz recently. So down in Helmand, of course, the um, events are still occurring really all over the province, if you will, rather than isolated uh, in one particular city. And I think it's important to remember, too, that Helmand continues to be the Taliban's main effort. It has been for quite a while. Uh, they remain focused, and so they commit a lot of capability and a lot of effort into Helmand. But what we've really seen, um, you know, since this most recent uptick in fighting is the tactics by the Taliban have been very similar to what we saw at the beginning of August. And what I mean by that is we saw relatively, again, small Taliban elements, uh, essentially raiding parties that would prey on isolated checkpoints and in some cases some isolated district centers. Um, the local security services would abandon those checkpoints. The Taliban takes them over, they loot them, and then in some cases they simply move out or security services will push them out. But of course we have seen fighting uh, on the outskirts of Lashkar Gah. And uh, we did see this terrible car bomb uh, that occurred uh, in Lashkar Gah as well. But really since Monday, the Afghan government has brought in uh, additional forces between two and three hundred, uh, led by the commandos as well, and they've now reoccupied uh, several of these checkpoints uh, that were initially abandoned. I think you're also aware there's a new corps commander uh, for that for the 215th Corps, and as he just showed up a week ago Monday and immediately went into the fight, but as he's had the opportunity to assess the situation, what we believe is he's recognized that the ANDSF is a bit overextended. And so he's made a deliberate decision to withdraw some of his forces back into Lashkar Gah so that they can have mass and they can help defend Lashkar Gah and then be prepared to move to the offense. And then finally, of course, uh, Governor Hyatt, uh, the provincial governor uh, in Helmand, in our view, continues to really show and demonstrate some leadership uh, with this, not only the security services, but with the larger government effort and with his larger efforts uh, to try and uh, defend Lashkar Gah and, uh, and the, the larger province. So let me take a step back then and discuss or touch on kind of the larger context. And so you all have all heard me say this before, but when we still look at the ANDSF performance in 2015 and we compare it with what we have seen in 2016, we do still believe that the performance this year is better than last year. But what I would tell you also is that does not mean that things are perfect or that the war is over. You know, very clearly, you know, the last week plus has demonstrated that there are still many challenges uh, ahead of everybody and that this is a tough fight and that the government is going to have to continue to focus uh, on their security services. And again, that's not just our assessment of it. It's the assessment of the, the government of Afghanistan. And I think as you look at the larger international community and you look at the commitments <clears throat> that have been made in 2016, First at Warsaw with NATO committing to continue this mission uh, as well as continuing to fund the ANA out to 2020. And then most recently uh, in Brussels where of course you've had the uh, international community led by the European Union commit to 15 billion dollars in money to help develop this country. And of course it was a very, very stark contrast as you flip on the news last week and you see the government in Brussels securing 15 billion dollars and then in the next frame you see the Taliban destroying Kunduz and destroying those efforts. <clears throat> but overall, as we look at this year in total, 
and we begin in March to really the end of July 2016, what you saw was the ANDSF essentially and generally on the offensive, moving through their campaign plan. Beginning of August, of course, uh, we have seen the Taliban attempt to take these provincial capitals. Uh, they have not been successful. And as we move forward, we believe that the ANDSF will continue to secure Kunduz and Lashkar Gah, and NATO and U.S. forces will be here uh, to continue to assist them. So with that said, uh, let me pause, and again, I welcome your questions. Uh, Josh, um, first question, uh, I mean, as a result of this, campaign that you mentioned by the, you know, the, the Afghan forces being on the offensive. And it's also something that the new authorities that President Obama authorized were specifically supposed to aid, mm -hmm. in my understanding. I mean, what concretely has that achieved, given that we still see the Taliban attacking these uh, provincial, you know, centers that, as you say, have been their goal for a long mm -hmm. time? If they're still in a position to do that, you know, what's been achieved? Yeah, so overall, we do believe that there, there have been achievements and there have been progress. And, and I would begin with Josh. Um, obviously, this is a difficult fight, and we're, we're not going to see the security situation change overnight. President Obama absolutely did provide those authorities to the United States, and we have been implementing and executing those authorities since the middle of June. And we think it really assisted uh, the ANDSF in Nangahar as they continued their campaign plan uh, through Nangahar and in, into July. Uh, we do believe it has been a big assistance as they have continued to try and not only defend Helmand and Lashkar Gah, but of course after the initial engagements in early August, what we saw is the Afghans went back on the offensive. And then finally in Kunduz, of course, we saw um, uh, efforts to really try and clear the northern districts uh, as well. But again, that's not to say that there have not been challenges and things have not, uh, everything has not gone, you know, the, the way that we would have liked. But we will continue to engage and we think those authorities have been very effective for us in supporting the Afghans in their larger campaign plan. And I guess it does go back to the larger point that I mentioned earlier, which is the Taliban's strategic goal has been to capture a provincial capital and they have not been successful with that in multiple attempts. As a follow-up on that, I mean, you mentioned that in, for example, in Kunduz, the Taliban have been able to, you know, without capturing, you know, actually holding the city, cause a lot of problems for everybody. Um, and I mean, you know, as you as you mentioned, they, I mean, you know, their goal their their goal is to just keep fighting as long as possible because that puts pressure on the government. How can the Afghan government, you know, backed by you guys? change that equation because right now it seems like wherever they are, you know, if their only goal is to just keep fighting for as long as possible because that causes problems, mm -hmm. then it seems like they're in a perfect position to, you know, achieve their goals. Sure. So obviously the ultimate solution is going to be a, a negotiated reconciliation uh, that brings the parties together. And so our goal uh, within NATO uh, is to essentially make the security services as strong as we possibly can through this train, advise, and assist. And then from a U.S. authority standpoint, the effort is to continue to assist their strategic campaign plan while also using some of these authorities to really serve as a bridge while the Afghan capabilities continue to build up. So ultimately the goal being to make those security services as strong as we possibly can um, so that the Taliban finally does recognize they are not going to be successful and that we move to an Afghan-led negotiated reconciliation. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Kloban. Uh, as you say that uh, about the, the same clashes on the ground, we just want to know that about the reports that uh, say that uh, United States forces, U.S. forces in Afghanistan, they use uh, uh, B-52 mm -hmm. military aircraft. Do you want to know about the, the number of the attack, if mm -hmm. you have that? And, uh, uh, some other question about the condos and also Helmand. Report says that uh, militant camps from from Pakistan, especially in Jaish e Muhammad and also Lashkar Taiba. If you have any report about that, mm -hmm. let me begin first with the question about the B-52s and whether B-52s were used. Um, obviously, we use a variety of different assets uh, to to assist the government of Afghanistan. Um, we don't get into a whole lot of specifics on, on all of them, but the real important thing from our perspective is not necessarily the asset 
but really the effects that they deliver and they achieve uh, on the ground. But I would tell you in this case, B-52s have not been used uh, in October uh, with this. Um, regarding your question about the uh, involvement of Pakistanis, uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know. I'd refer you to the, to the government on that. Um, and so we, I have not seen any uh, reports of that. Mm -hmm. um, there were uh, significant changes in Taliban's communication strategy the, in Kunduz and as well as mm -hmm. Lashkar Gah, they, uh, they had some live coverage in Twitter from mm -hmm. their uh, advancing and also th they were sharing some videos from each area they were capturing. So what do you think? Uh, they are getting some uh, technical assistance from, from some certain countries? or? Because the change is very huge, and mm -hmm. Taliban was not so successful in technical coverage. Right. No, it's a great question. I, I don't know if they are getting assistance from some other location, but yeah, I think you're right. Uh, over this year, 2016, we have seen the Taliban try and significantly increase their communications and uh, really their psychological operations, if you will. Uh, and that has been one of the challenges that I think the ANDSF has had to deal with and had to, uh, to confront because oftentimes, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's really a question about the Taliban's truthfulness. I think we all recognize, um, you know, that, that part of their tactics and part of their techniques is to lie and they do that constantly. I mean, again, this is the same old organization that, uh, you know, didn't tell the world or even their own organization that uh, Mullah Omar had been dead for two years. And so, and we are constantly fielding these crazy requests of the Taliban killed 15 Americans here or blew up this and everything else. The challenge, though, is that when they put this information out, there are some Afghans uh, who do believe it, and it helps spread a panic. And, you know, using the, um, going back to Hellman, for example, so, you know, what we saw in August, and we've seen some of this again, is the Taliban will engage uh, a particular checkpoint. The flag goes up. Uh, that goes out into the uh, public space, and all of a sudden, you, you have people who are now afraid that the Taliban are coming for them next. And so it does cause some of these additional challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, every time a city is on the verge to collapse, the response from the government is to send special forces. Mm -hmm. But at the end of this summer, for instance, they've been sent so many times to so many places. How many are there, and how long can they support these mm -hmm. kind of people? Don't you feel that at a point they could be exhausted and mm -hmm. not able to fight anymore? Yeah, thank you, Ann. So um, there are currently about 17,000 Afghan special forces, and that includes <clears throat> not only a and um, special forces, but it also includes some of the special police units uh, from the MOI. And as I think you've heard me say before, they continue to be the most effective special operations capability really in this entire region, and they do extraordinary work, and they, they continue to get better. But you did hit on a very uh, key point that we are concerned about and we watch closely, and that's the overuse of these special operations forces. And you're right, when there is a challenge to a city, oftentimes these special operations forces are put into uh, the breach immediately to try and de either defend and then counterattack and then take specific locations. And so as we move into the winter, one of the big things that we are focused on is how can we help the Afghans regenerate uh, capability and capacity. And so we really want to take from the special operations elements the best practices and the best lessons learned and help export them into the conventional forces. <clears throat> the number one piece of it is leadership. You find that the special operations elements just have very good, solid, and committed junior and senior level leaders and that makes a huge difference in terms of the will to fight you know for their subordinates the other aspect is they have been able to try and maintain an operational readiness cycle and it has not been perfect but by and large what they're able to do is they're able to put some of their soldiers into the fight for a period then they're able to pull them back and give them uh, vacation uh, do individual training and then it get those units back together and do collective training before they go off to their next mission and so that is something as well that we think is very important for the conventional forces to be able to uh, adopt and put into their their daily efforts yeah Lynn. Taliban have had a very heavy presence up there for a long time. 
there have been a number of serious attempts to take the city this year, as you've said. Mm -hmm. um, you're relying on, the Afghans are relying on, as you say, 17,000 special forces to cover the whole country, and there's a lot going on nationwide. Uh, where was the failure in Kunduz mm -hmm. this time that the Taliban were able to get inside the city mm -hmm. um, in the way that they did? They're still fighting, um, and uh, the no matter what you say about their propaganda prowess, they've given the very clear impression that they once again took the city. Mm -hmm. So is it intelligence? Is it um, uh, numbers? What, Mm -hmm. Where was the failure? Sure. So, uh, and I would say there, there clearly was a failure uh, up in Kunduz. And again, I think the government of Afghanistan has absolutely acknowledged that, and the security ministers have as well. At this point, uh, Lynn, I think it's probably too early to, to be able to put our fingers specifically on what happened. Um, the, um, you know, again, the positive aspect of it is the the aspect of what the Special Operations Forces did, their ability to get back in, and then the ability for the ANDSF to start very methodically trying to clear these places. But clearly there is there's work to be done, and that is something that the Afghans are going to have to focus on, and it's something that we'll uh, be here to try and assist them with through our train, advise, and assist. Uh, go to the next hand. Okay, let's move Jessica. I don't, Jessica. I would have to refer you back to uh, the government. But, uh, you know, as we've discussed before, the, the number of casualties is always a concern. Hi, Nuri from Audio News. We recently had reports of training uh, in, uh, security forces with the Taliban. Uh, what do you think? Why these things happen with the uh, Afghan security forces and uh, why you're going to the Taliban? What is the reason? And my second question is about the level of training you have given, uh, given uh, to uh, Afghan forces. Uh, what level you have uh, reached now, and uh, what look more needed to uh, get training mm -hmm. uh, Afghan forces? Sure. Thank you very much. So your first question about security forces. Um, the uh, I'm sure there are every single location in every single province is is going to be different and you know when those types of things occur I'm sure there's a different reason for all of it but one of the things that we focus on and that we remain uh, uh, really engaged with our Afghan counterparts to for them to focus on as well as overall leadership and so what we find is if you have poor leaders at essentially the Kandak level or the Khoi level these small unit leaders who are not providing ammunition to their soldiers, they're not providing food, they're not providing supplies, obviously those soldiers have to ask themselves, why would I fight for this person, why would I continue to, to do this? And so we do think that that is absolutely a contributing factor, uh, is poor leadership uh, at, uh, at a local level and uh, at a low level. Uh, and then the question of uh, what level do we train the Afghan forces to? And of course, there are, there are multiple uh, components of that. <clears throat> As you know right now, our train, advise, and assist mission with the NATO piece is focused on the Army Corps and the police zone level. So our focus at that point is to assist those senior leaders on both the MOD and the MOI side to help them understand how best to employ their forces across multiple provinces, how best to get logistics in, how best to run these larger organizations. Here in Kabul, we also provide advisors at the ministerial level. And so we do that with the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of the Interior. And we try and assist them with all the components of any large organization, so human resources, intelligence, operations. But we also try and assist them with their budgeting, uh, as well as their ability to investigate themselves, so the creation of inspector generals and, and that type of thing. And then finally, at a tactical level, our uh, NATO Special Operations Forces assist the Afghan Special Operations Forces, again, from both the, the Army and the police, in some of the, the tactical aspects of what they're doing. And then the final area that you, you've heard us discuss as well is the Air Force. And so we do spend an awful lot of time at a very low level uh, trying to provide hands-on training uh, to our Afghan Air Force counterparts. Some of that occurs in the West where these pilots undergo training and maintainers undergo training and everything else. And then some of that occurs here. And so those are the areas that we do focus on in terms of moving forward in the future. <clears throat> you know, we believe that, that we'll continue to try and, and work all of those things that I just described to you. So the Air Force piece, uh, we feel very optimistic about the accomplishments and the achievements of the Afghan Air Force. 
If you look in just the period of 12 months, this time last year, they did not have any of the A-29 attack aircraft. The number of their attack helicopters, these MD-530 is very, very small. And now we are a year later where they are taking the lead and they are absolutely employing those aircraft uh, very, very well. Uh, the Special Operations Forces will continue to do that. And then really the decisions that came out of the Warsaw Conference uh, in July, the NATO decision, was to continue the mission as is, to continue to do this train, advise, and assist at the Army Corps and the police zone level. All right, uh, Force of America. Aisha. Aisha. Um, have you seen any additional, um, like, any signs of any help coming from Iran or Russia for the Taliban or any of the militants because they seem to have additional contact with them? You, you may have a, additional information. Our overall message is that any country in the region uh, has got to be focused on supporting the government of Afghanistan, that it is clearly the decision of the people of Afghanistan for this government uh, to continue to, to defend them. We believe they're making progress, and so overall, Anybody in the region who is engaged, in our view, uh, is productive if they're supporting the government of Afghanistan. You know, I'm just about any indications that they're supporting the Taliban in any way, providing money, weapons, anything? Have you had any indication that they're providing well, help? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I don't have specific indications uh, to, to describe for you today. But overall, of course, um, you know, those, those countries do maintain uh, an engagement, if you will, in Afghanistan and certainly have an interest in Afghanistan. Uh, Phil? Uh, just following up on his question a bit, um, I wondered if you have any information about the total number of uh, Taliban fighters. Um, or does it seem to be growing? Is it something that's concerning you? I don't have specifics. Our, our general assessment right now is there's still uh, probably about uh, 30,000. Of course, some of those are very, very hardcore. Some of those are seasonal. Um, some of those, you know, come in and out of the fight, et cetera. But that is generally our, our continued working assessment is about, about 30,000 or so. Uh, yeah, Josh? <clears throat> um, one of my colleagues out of Washington recently had a story about that there have been 44 or so Afghan security um, personnel who during their training in the U.S. disappeared one way or another. Is that, in just the last 18 months or so, I understand, mm -hmm. um, is this something that's putting a damper at all on efforts to try to train, you know, uh, and I'm assuming these are kind of the higher level Afghan troops mm -hmm. as well that are going to the U.S. Is this, is this uh, you know, causing problems for that at all? It, it's, I think if you take that number that you just put out and you compare it to the total number of Afghan uh, service members and police who not only go to the United States but go to the West and other locations for training, it is a small percentage. So the short answer is it, it's not putting a damper on it, uh, but it's obviously something that we work with our Afghan partners to prevent and reduce uh, as much as possible. Have you seen, um, sorry, just to follow up mm -hmm. on that, um, I mean, it, it, part of the overall refugee you know, situation has increased. Have mm -hmm. you seen the rate of, of soldiers or trainees disappearing in the U.S. increase in recent years compared yeah. to Yeah, I, I don't know. I, we would have to do some research on that, Josh. It's not something that has been uh, elevated, if you will. It's not something that has, you know, to come up on our radar screen, if you will. So the short answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anna, what is another question? Um, yes, can you give us an estimation of how many uh, strikes you conducted Recently, how many the Afghan Air Force conducted, how many are strike they sure. conducted, and how much they increased? Sure. Uh, I don't have a good assessment for you on the number of Afghan airstrikes, and so the, the MOD would, would probably have to provide that for you. Uh, and again, they do have multiple platforms, the A-29s, the MD-530s. They also have the MI-35s uh, that they use uh, as well. Just to give you a, a quick snapshot, um, you know, so I, up in Kunduz, uh, really since about uh, the 3rd of October or so, we've taken in Kunduz City or really on the, uh, in other parts of Kunduz province about 30 strikes. Uh, or we've had, I guess better said, we've had about 30 air-to-ground engagements, uh, if you will, uh, to really help try and defend uh, the ANDSF up there. And then down in Helmand, we've taken about 15 or so uh, air-to-ground engagements, uh, again, since the beginning of October. Now, those are dynamic numbers, uh, of course, uh, but uh, those are the, the general estimations. But when do you think that the Afghan Air Force will be able to take the lead on airstrikes? How well, can it take? Well, we, we, we don't, uh, I don't have a specific date or a specific time for you, Ann, but it is one of the things, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 
our work with the Afghan Air Force is, is something that we do focus on quite a bit. And the A-29s and the MD-530s in particular have been very well used all over the country uh, in, these, in these engagements. And as we talk about the training of the Air Force and these, these other uh, aspects, it's not just pilots. Of course, there's an entire ecosystem that goes into supporting an aircraft when it goes out on a mission. And so there's a maintenance aspect of it, there's a planning aspect of it, there's a targeting aspect of it. There's all those types of things that do fall into this ecosystem to, to get aircraft into the air. And so we're trying to work all of those uh, really simultaneously to, to get the Afghan Air Force even further uh, along than they are right now. Elise? Yeah. There are ongoing fights in uh, Nongara. Mm -hmm. we, we hear every day about uh, killings or mm -hmm. arrests and stuff. Can you tell us a little more about the situation? What is, how, how NATO is involved there? Sure. So NATO is, is not... Um, you mentioned the, the strikes, and, and let me just kind of divide that. Obviously, the Afghans uh, have been conducting successful off uh, offensive operations in Nangarhar, and it started off with Special Operations Forces, and then it was followed by the 201st Corps uh, and their conventional forces. So the NATO role, uh, the really the train, advise, and assist role, is to work with the core leadership and the police zone leadership to, again, do as I described earlier, which is help them understand how to maneuver their forces across uh, multiple provinces, as well as bring in logistics and support. Uh, the U.S. does have unilateral authority uh, to target uh, Daesh by status. And so what that means is once we identify uh, Daesh, we're able to target them. And so we have been assisting them uh, in that process as well. And that is, again, you know, the, the United States, of course, is here for two missions. Number one is the counterterrorism mission uh, focused on al-Qaeda and then focused on Daesh. And then the other is our contribution to the train, advise, and assist mission uh, to, as part of the larger NATO train, advise, and assist mission. So, sorry, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't maybe really get mm -hmm. the military vocabulary. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, what do you mean, unilateral authority to target Daesh? What kind of target? I mean, how do you target it? Sure. So what that means really is once we identify uh, somebody is a member of Daesh, uh, we have the authority to target them regardless of what they're doing. And so we can use whatever means we, we require. And it, the intent is to capture or kill them. And, uh, but uh, as part of the U.S. authorities here, we have that uh, authority uh, with both al-Qaeda as well as uh, with Daesh. Christine, you had a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, with the absence of fighting as you across the country, um, several um, simultaneous larger offenses, what is your thinking on the resources they're using up. That's an awful lot of ammunition mm -hmm. and weapons, and that also relates, of course, to recruitment. So, mm -hmm. what is the Taliban's resource base right now? Is it improving? And, um, and also the finances mm -hmm. is something that I'm just wondering about. Sure. So I, I don't have a great answer for you on the Taliban's resource base, but what we do know is that, and what we do believe, is that they are struggling financially right now. And the evidence we've seen of that are, again, the increases in their taxes to locals uh, as they move through. Uh, we believe that the death of Mullah Mansour uh, certainly contributed to that uh, as well. And uh, the reason being is he was primarily a financial guy uh, before he uh, assumed the leadership of the Taliban. And so uh, we believe that he was probably uh, also involved in the narcotics aspect as well. So we think they are having some financial challenges right now uh, and they are having some financial issues, uh, which then does, there's a trickle down authority to everything else. And so, uh, or a trickle down aspect to, to everything else when you don't have the money to buy munitions and equipment and everything else. Uh, but of course what we've also seen is when they will raid a checkpoint, then they kind of restock some of their supplies as well. So we think some of their uh, resupply efforts really come from these raids to go into a checkpoint uh, or some other locale to steal things. But is that, is that uh, dark money thing still true with apparently the, um, the harvest in the south being extremely good? Mm -hmm. Well, we did expect, I mean, it was a good harvest, and we did expect the Taliban to be flush with money. But since that time, of course, Mansour was killed. And, of course, we have seen this evidence in particular uh, of the taxes being raised on local populations. So we, we do believe that is, uh, that is still true. I would come back to them for a second. Do you have a question, Chad? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, so going back to uh, talking about the unilateral strikes mm -hmm. against Daesh, um, has there been a change in the assessment of the September 28th uh, strike uh, that you now assess, you know, I think 15 
civilians, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, is the U.S. still saying that they were mostly uh, Daesh, or, mm -hmm. or can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, as you've heard me say before, we do take any allegation of civilian casualties incredibly seriously. And um, the reason for that, of course, is our whole purpose for being over here on the train, advise, and assist side is to help the ANDSF be able to secure the Afghan population. And so uh, any allegations that, that we've done something counter to that, of course, we, we do investigate and we do look at very closely. So at this point, uh, there have been two investigations uh, that have been conducted. Um, there's a third one that is in the works right now and, and is in progress right now. But our view after the results of these first two investigations remains that the individuals who were killed in that strike were members of ISK, members of Daesh, and we do believe it was a valid military target. But again, we will continue to, uh, to uh, work this uh, as quickly as we possibly can. For a follow-up, can you, uh, those two investigations, mm -hmm. those are U.S. investigations or? There's a re resolute support investigation and an Afghan investigation, and we're working, and we continue to work with our Afghan partners uh, to get every piece of information we can. Uh, um, do you see any a geographical tie-up with um, the the spread of the fighting at the moment? For instance, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at what's happening in Helmand, it would be very, um, it might be smart to link the the march of the Taliban across most of the province to. Mm -hmm. Uh, gang warfare over control of the drugs because that's where the money comes and you mm -hmm. say that there's a little bit of a, um, a shortage of cash going on. Um, do you look at it in those terms, um, government uh, versus uh, narco-traffickers mm -hmm. slash Taliban or whatever, and do you also um, look at it uh, geographically? So, you know, we're looking at stuff going on um, near the border of Tajikistan a drug smuggling mm -hmm. route, Turkmenistan, a drug smuggling route, Pakistan, a drug smuggling route. Can you tie it all up to narco-trafficking mm -hmm. in that way? And can you see um, also a, a government Taliban uh, drug war going on? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, it, you raise a great point. And uh, of course, our view is that the Taliban is not this pristine, pure ideological movement. Everything you just described, we think factors into not only their larger efforts, because we think that was certainly a part of Mullah Mansour was doing, but we think that also factors into some of the internal divisions uh, that they have uh, shown over the last 18 months uh, or so. And then we think as we look at some of these tactical challenges uh, that have happened, specifically down in Helmand, but in other parts of the country as well, we don't think it is all just, again, this ideologically pure fight. We think there is absolutely a criminal component to this, uh, and there's absolutely uh, the narcotics certainly would play a, a piece in that. Uh, of course, we don't have all the specifics of that land right now, but we do see more and more evidence that clearly the Taliban is more engaged uh, with the narcotics trafficking. They certainly were with Mullah Mansour. Uh, we think it's a more important aspect of what they're doing, and we do think it has an influence uh, on the events that are uh, occurring in Afghanistan. Getting started early helped a lot, and why we were able to do it. Um, as I look at the clock, we probably have time for about two more questions is what I'm thinking. Uh, Aisha? Yes. Um, so you described how Mullah Mansour was good with uh, handling Taliban money. What about the new leader, mm -hmm. uh, Hibatullah? Do you think he's proving to be good for Taliban, a more formidable mm -hmm. opponent, or you know, he seems to have unified them? Sure. We, we have not seen a whole lot from Mullah Habatullah, and as, as you may be aware, his, uh, his role within the Taliban was much more of a religious role. So he was essentially uh, the individual who was justifying and issuing the fact was supporting a lot of this violence uh, against individuals and civilians. Uh, and of course, um, once he assumed this latest role, we haven't seen a tremendous amount of control that he has got. His only real guidance, to the best of our knowledge, has been that the Taliban should continue Operation Omari, specifically trying to capture a provincial capital. And of course then the, the role of Siraj Haqqani and, and his role uh, is, is not entirely clear to us either. But by and large we have not seen much from Habatullah other than he has clearly been a religious leader historically. And again he is the one who has frankly provided the justification for a lot of these atrocious acts uh, that the Taliban have undertaken. I think there's Jessica. Oh, I see back there. Jessica, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering uh, if uh, you have any um, assessment of why the Taliban in the last 
because our agenda focused towards that. Richard Hampton has come under a heavy attack mm -hmm. over the last few days, and uh, Taliban is supposedly within a couple of kilometers of mm -hmm. the provincial, the governor's compound. Why do you think they've turned their focus on Farah suddenly? I think it goes back to what we described earlier, Jessica, that uh, as a movement, they are absolutely trying before this year is over to seize a provincial capital. And uh, we think that obviously they have not been successful in Kunduz, they have not been successful in Lashkar and so it may very well be that they view the opportunity uh, to engage in Farah uh, as their opportunity to try and seize a provincial capital. But again, what we do believe and what we, we do think is that the ANDSF, specifically the 207th Corps, less about the special operations capabilities, but more about that specific core, they have responded pretty well to these attacks. And so we know there is ongoing fighting, but we do believe that that 207th Corps out there has done a pretty good job of defending um, Farah City.